Greetings. Welcome to the third and final part of this quick trip through astronomy for astrologers here at Stormy's YouTube University. In part two, we began to ask this question of why are the quadrants of a chart so often unequal? Like here in Dali's chart, why is the meridian, the vertical line, not vertical at all, but rather leaning towards the right, leaning towards the descendant? And the answer is rooted in something we explored in part one, which is the truth that there are northern and southern signs of the zodiac. And the tropical zodiac really shows us because, again, it's based upon the interface of the ecliptic, the plane of the year, and the equator, the plane of the day. And there are northern signs, signs that are north of the equator. They are tropical Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, and Virgo. Now, those signs rise north of east, and they set north of west. There are southern signs, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces. They rise south of east. They set south of west. Which of these do you think rises most south? And the answer is the Sagittarius Capricorn cusp, which rises most north. And the answer is the Gemini Cancer cusp. And look at that Cancer glyph. We're going to see that just like the crab that walks sideways and lives at the surf where the water walks sideways to kiss Earth's body, right? That just like that cancer glyph, that the signs of the zodiac every day rudder back and forth sideways across the cardinal directions. All right, well, where are the cardinal directions? rooted and remember that's from earth's axis of rotation the world tree the spine of gaia which defines true north right north pole and true south south pole on earth and in the heavens so so much about the directions and the tropical zodiac is a directional zodiac can be understood when we follow the sun, which rises on the eastern horizon through the fourth quadrant, reaches at the midheaven, moves to rest at the descendant in the western horizon, roots down below the ground at the IC, the Imam Cheli, the bottom of the heavens. In this clockwise motion in the chart, right, which is kind of contrary to what we're used to doing, because we're used to saying, okay, the counterclockwise motion, right, house one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, look, they're numbered that way, the quadrants are numbered one, two, three, four, but you can see the arrows here, the primary motion, the daily motion, the result of earth, which is the cross of matter, spinning west to east, the daily motion brings the signs and all of the stars and the planets with them clockwise through the chart wheel, which is a reflection of the Northern Hemisphere experience of the spinning heavens. I asked this question, but didn't answer it in the second part of, well, if the sun rises into the 12th, why isn't that the first? Why would we go from the 12th to the 11th to the 10th? The sun does this every day. What? And there's this delineation of the 12th house, which is hidden things. Why in the heavens could we possibly call the 12th hidden if that's actually where every day the sun rises from invisibility below the horizon to visibility above the horizon? The sun in the first cannot be seen. I mean, granted, that's when we start like knowing that the sun is about to rise and the birds are chirping and, you know, it's the dawn and all that. So why would the 12th be hidden things if that's where the sun rises? Because the sun rises to illuminate the earth, but when he does, he hides the heavens, right? So... Stellarium still showing us where Saturn and Mercury are, you know, and these lines of constellations, that's all gone, 
and we're in the daytime, right? So when the sun is in houses 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, it's day. And when in 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, night, you yeah. know? Okay. But the software lets us play. And let's explore the truth. Like this says so much, right? Which is that you have a cross of matter. You have, pardon the expression, but a cross that you are nailed to, right? And after the moment of your birth, which is the expression of a moment in time, astronomical time and arrangement of the planets, which will never repeat from a specific place, right? Remember the moment is the planet in the signs. The place you were born shows us the planet in the houses. Your houses are your houses from that moment moving forward, right? So after the ascendant is defined, right? Or even if we just look at the truth of the ascendant where things go up, right? Well, what will after the moment of your birth or the moment here of this chart, what will be the first planets to rise? Considering that everything is moving in the daily motion, rising and reaching and resting and rooting in this clockwise direction on the chart, right? Well, in this case, moon and Mars, because they're in the first. They will be the first to rise up to the horizon after the moment of this chart. What will be the last to get to the horizon and the answer to the eastern horizon is the sun because the sun has already risen and this is true of everything in the 12th they will be 12th to rise again so the planets in the first and they might not be planets there but that sign those stars they will be the first to rise and then the second succeeds the first to the angle you'll hear the second called a succident house where the 12th, it's called cadent. It means falling. It's falling away from the angle. Okay, so the sun's got to, from there, reach midday, go rest, sunset, go root, midnight, and then rise up again. Right, so the planets in the first are the first to rise. Now, I usually utilize this graphic to bring us on an exploration of morning stars and evening stars that take us into planetary synodic cycles and what it is uh, and why it is that planets retrograde and how that's different for mercury and venus than it is for mars jupiter saturn and beyond and there's just so much more to share but right now i think the most important thing i can show is in seeing it reflected here and the very truth that we call the first the first and the 12th the 12th I mean, what it says is you are your cross and especially the ascendant right which separates the 12th of hidden things in the mysteries from the first of you and old words for the ascendant are the horoscopos. All right, so we hear horoscope and you're like, yeah, that newspaper column. But actually horoscope, which is also used to describe any map of the heavens like a chart. Horoscopos is Greek for the hour marker, the hour watcher, and it is the ascendant. Another name for the ascendant back in the day, it's O-I-A-X. Although the Greek letters would be pronounced differently than that, right? And depending on the era of Greek, I understand this is either pronounced oiox or iakos. And it means the rudder. Many will often say helm. And we have these images of like, you know, like a steering wheel, like the helm of a ship. But back in the day, they didn't have that, right? They had the tiller and the rudder. So in ancient astrology, there's a lot of interest in the so-called Lord of the hour marker, the planet that rules the ascending sign. And that's not really an astronomical thing. So it's beyond the scope of this transmission, right? But I'll just share for now that that planet was also called the steersman of the chart. It's the planet that has the hand on the rudder. Yeah. And we're going to see now why this would be called the rudder. And why that ruddering motion is responsible for um, unequal quadrants like this, if you will. 
and um, we're going to go freestyle to do so. So let's head over and um, honor this medicine wheel I built in Sedona, which was aligned to Saturn at the time, um, but also bring us back into this example chart that we've been utilizing of DALI. And we're going to go over to Stellarium astronomy software to tune deeper into this. So let's um, bring ourselves to Dali in this feet on the ground planetarium software, and we'll head then to Figueres, Spain, which is this one, right? It's right by Barcelona. You know, I think that's not it. There we go. Okay. Um, and then in May of 19. 04 on the 11th at 8 45 a.m. All right, so that's Dali. Now, clearly, <laughs> we're not, you know, let me take this full screen. Clearly, we're not going to be able to see all of these directions at once, okay? <laughs> we have to have bug eyes to be able to see, um, you know, like, north and east and south and west i mean that's like literally a 360 degree view right so let's this is kind of more like the human experience right even if you're looking at the ground you got to look up to see the sun right and the sun's up that high so it's cool that the software lets us play um and to dim the atmosphere so we can see the other lights even by day and these other things that we've wrapped about so what I want you to notice, um, and let's look at this in Dolly's chart, you have the moon culminating at the meridian midheaven. Okay. That's here. And what I want you to see is that the midheaven is cardinal direction, right? We were showing that recently, well, in part two, that these meridians, they are lines of longitude on the earth. They are north south lines. In other words, and let's look at it. Um, Let's see, I guess if I turn our head towards the west and we're seeing way more sky than you could ever see with your eyes, that's more like that and you'd have to look up, right? But if you were able to lay on your back and look up at the zenith, that's here, okay? So the meridian, as I've shared before, it's a great circle. It divides the heavens in half through the cardinal directions north and south. It passes through the zenith at the top of the heavenly dome. It passes through the nadir down here below our feet, right? So the horizon is a great circle that divides the dome from like what's above the ground and what's below the ground equally. And then the meridian is a line that divides um, through north, south. And so the midheaven, which is remember where the ecliptic the zodiac, right? The plane of the earth sun relationship intersects the meridian above ground. It's always going to be cardinal direction because it's on the meridian. And the meridian is your local north south great circle, right? You feel that? In our day and age, like we've said, we are blessed to have a north star. Polaris, North Star, which is so close to the North Celestial Pole. It is the tail star of Ursa Minor, or the Little Bear. And you can star jump there from Ursa Major, the Big Bear, who has an astrum you likely know called the Big Dipper. Well, these two stars of the Big Dipper are called the Pointer Stars because you can draw a line through them. And it's about four or five of that measurement that brings you to North Star. So that's the star that's at the center of the rotation. So as the Earth is spinning, remember Earth spins from the west to the east, our experience of that is the heavens spinning from the east to the west, right? Because we're standing on Earth. So as I move, and I'll just move through hours here, what we're going to see is that this east to west motion when we're looking north is 
counterclockwise or anticlockwise and we're just going to see everything spinning about the north pole so like here's the dipper at this point it's kind of pointing down we'll see that the dipper is then going to move up here cassiopeia is another northern constellation which just goes around the north star so here like cassiopeia is like an e but about a quarter turn which is six hours later it's going to be a w and then like another quarter turn a three and another quarter turn an m you see let's go back to dolly and we'll look south so there's the south celestial pole as well which we can't see unless we take the ground away that's down here right so that's also in the middle of this kind of rotational zone that's the point like the axis points there the axle points there right so everything is also spinning around that point now when we're looking south this place is east on our left and west on our right this is the ecliptic but here's the equator which because it is literally perpendicular to the north south spin axis always moves through the directions east and west. When we were looking at that house's animation before, I was using the equator, not the ecliptic, so we didn't get this bouncing around. Let me move this through time, and you're gonna see everything going now clockwise. When we look south, that east to west motion is clockwise, and everything's gonna be spinning around this point, the south celestial pole, but it's down below the ground. So dig Orion who was rising at the time of Dali's birth. Orion's gonna come climbing up, right? It's gonna culminate up here at the midheaven, the reach, and then start going down to the rest. Oops. Okay, so let's just move through hours and we'll watch that. And you'll see that the celestial equator stays due east and due west, but you're gonna find that's not true for the ascendant which remember is where the ecliptic intersects the eastern horizon. So let's watch Orion climb up and culminate here. Right? This, there is a point where this is a pretty serious, like cross, <laughs> crossy cross. But now we're gonna let Orion go set in the west and look at where the ascendant is, south of east must be a southern sign rising. Look at where the descendant is, north of west. Must be a northern sign, like Dali's Taurus sun, setting. Now, what does that mean for the quadrants? Okay, let's rewind back to Dali. So I'm rewinding time now, right? I'm gonna take the celestial equator away and we'll look at the quadrants. <clears throat> Here in Stellarium, and again, you know, this would be much more like your human experience and actually be more like that <laughs> during the day and there wouldn't be cartoons in the sky or these convenient lines and all that or like the Aries glyph just floating out here in the middle of nowhere. Um, the Aries glyph, of course, being what? Where the ecliptic passes over the celestial equator moving northward and in the northern hemisphere that means moving towards the heavens towards the top of the sky all right so the software lets us play we've got the ground the horizontal line of our cross of matter and then we have the meridian now look at the quadrants so dali here has a much smaller fourth quadrant than the first quadrant Right. Remember that the um, first quadrant, let's get here, is everything between the ascendant and the midheaven. And that's why we see yellow, right? The sun's rising, that kind of the beautiful yellow light of the day. And then at midday, it turns into the red flames, right? Probably be better to center the colors like with the angle in between them. But this is that pivot where now we move from going up to going down, right? 
Okay, so the fourth quadrant is houses 10, 11, 12, or I should say when we follow the motion this way, 12, 11, 10, everything between the ascendant and the midheaven. So usually you hear modern astrologers say, oh, the ascendant to the IC, the IC to the descendant, the descendant to the midheaven, the midheaven to the ascendant, because look, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And once our cross is fixed, it's like that. Right? The moon, as I'm recording this transmission, is in the sign of Scorpio. It's here. And then it's going to go into Sagittarius. Then it's going to go into Capricorn. Then it's going to go into Aquarius. The sun's currently in, in Pisces. Right? I'm recording this on March 3rd, 2021. The sun's right here. And then it's going to go into Aries. Then it's going to go into Taurus, and then it will be, you know, the anniversary of Dali's becoming. Um, so once the cross is fixed into matter, all the transiting planets, unless they're retrograde, are going this direction through the chart, right? But after this moment, remember, everything in the daily motion is going like this, and I'm really, a, I wanted to, like, redundantly, and redundancy is built into every good space mission say that again and again and again because if you go outside and you watch the heavens that's the direction that you're really going to first experience and it gets confusing because we're so used to it's like wait why would the sun rise over here and like i'm just watching it right now i'm watching the suns over here and, and where i'm experiencing life right now it's going to go set in the west like, how is that happening right so it's important to know that the chart goes both ways okay so you can see that dali's fourth quadrant between the ascendant and the midheaven is much larger than his fourth quadrant between the midheaven and the descendant. Why is that? Well, we're so often taught that the midheaven is directly above your head by astrologers who don't know astronomy. And again, you know, praises to Stormy for making astronomy part of your curriculum. It's so helpful, I find, to like have a grounded understanding, with like our feet on the ground of what these things actually are. The midheaven is not the top of the sky. It is twice a day in the tropics, okay? But where I live in the Bay Area in the Northern Hemisphere, where Dali was born in Spain, never going to happen. In Australia and, you know, Brazil and the Southern Hemisphere, never going to happen. You have to be between the tropics for that ph phenomenon to go down. So if you ever hear an astrology teacher tell you that the midheaven is the top of the sky, you can politely say to yourself, that's wrong, because it is, all right? And in fact, it's not even the point that's closest to the top of the sky. Now, another thing that astrologers will often teach that is not true to astronomy is that the ascendant is east. And here I might be nitpicking because it is eastern horizon. But look at Dali's Cancer Ascendant. Remember, what's the most northern point of the tropical zodiac? Zero degrees Cancer. So his ascendant is like 22 cancer. It's up in this zone, okay? Very far north of the equator. And as I said before, that means it's going to rise well north of east. Okay, I mean, I can play this game and show that. Dali's ascendant, it's at what's called an azimuth of 60, while north is zero, east is 90. So Dali's ascendant is a full 30 degrees north of east. Remember this, it is the meridian. It is the meridian midheaven and I see those are the ones that are actually cardinal directions. In the northern hemisphere, the meridian midheaven, I should say in the Northern Hemisphere, north of the Tropic of Cancer, to be correct, the Meridian Midheaven is always, 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 always due south. We're going to go to the Southern Hemisphere in a bit, where it's always due north, as we'll find. In the Northern Hemisphere, north of the Tropic of Cancer, like Fueras, Spain, the IC is always, always, always due north below ground. So for me to see the IC, which here is like off the screen, right? I'm going to have to turn around and look down below the ground. That's the IC, where the ecliptic 
intersects the meridian below the ground, yeah? The ascendant, where the ecliptic intersects the eastern horizon. But let me look due east, okay? The celestial equator is always going through that point. There's equator, but the ecliptic is not. Dali's ascendant, like 20 plus Cancer, is rising well north of east, as we saw about 30 degrees north of east, okay? It's interesting that in our day and age, and this changes with precession, the equator is moving right through Orion's belt. So Orion's rising due east and the northern hemisphere rises, the, the belt rises like a pillar. All right. Take the celestial equator away. We're going to look at the meridian midheaven. The ground back under our feet. It's a lot more like that. It's a lot more like this, but the software lets us play. Northern signs like Cancer rise north of east. Southern signs like Capricorn set south of west. So remember this, okay? And maybe I want to show you an image from another presentation. Because this is a, a good proof of the um, directionality of the tropical zodiac. <clears throat> Here's northern hemisphere experience of the solstice and equinox paths. This is, you know, kind of a rudimentary <laughs> image I created, but basically this is the horizon. You're standing on the ground here. This is the meridian moving through the cardinal directions north and south, okay? Zero Capricorn is the southernmost point of the tropical zodiac, right? So it rises south of east and it sets south of west. Now in the northern hemisphere where the meridian, midheaven, is always due south, that means this is the short trip right, from south of east through south to south of west. And of course, zero degrees tropical Capricorn hosts the sun for northern hemisphere winter solstice, right, shortest day of the year. The equinox points are the only points that rise due east and set due west. Zero Cancer, the most northern degree of the tropical zodiac, rises extremely north of east and sets extremely north of west. And those extremities, by the way, they increase with your distance from the equator, which is why, you know, places very far from the equator have more extreme seasons. The sun's traveling further on the horizons. That's the Cancer Glyph um, during the course of the year because the signs live in these places. Let's go back to um, equinox. Here's Libra, September equinox, right? So notice that like the cancer point, actually, let's go, that's summer solstice for the northern hemisphere. And solstice means the sun stops, stops what? Stops moving on the horizons north for six months, stops and turns around, see the cancer glyph and goes south for six months. All right. If you're rising north of east and setting north of west, but passing through the south, can you see how that's the long trip? So in the Northern Hemisphere, right, this is the day of the longest light, summer solstice. Now, on one sense, the opposite is true in the Southern Hemisphere, in the seasonal, you know, the day and night sense, light and night sense. But the directionality of this thing is not different. In the Southern Hemisphere, still, zero Capricorn is going to rise furthest south of east, but the midheavens in the north. So it's the long trip, right? Zero Capricorn tropical hosts the sun for summer solstice in the Southern Hemisphere. Equator, equinox, rising due east, setting due west. And now it's the zero Cancer degree, the most Northern degree of the Zodiac that will host the Southern Hemisphere winter solstice because rising north, moving through the north and setting north is the short day. Right, Libra back to balance, <laughs> equal light, equal night. Okay, cool. So let's head back um, here. Dali's birth moment. The moon is culminating 
And I want to show this to you as well. Okay, so it's 8.45 a.m. Let's go back to the time of moonrise. It's about 2.45 a.m. It takes about six hours for the moon to move from moonrise to culminating. And you're going to see this is where the moon now starts going down. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? So now it's moon set. And I'm not going to the exact time because I don't want to mess with my minutes here, right? So dig that, right? Just as we promise. <laughs> The meridian midheaven is where everything culminates halfway between the time that it rises and sets. So for the sun, that means midday, halfway between sunrise and sunset. For Uranus, it's like mid-Uranus, quote unquote, day, time above the horizon. For the moon, the same. So when da Dali's birth um, with the moon and the sign of Aries, very close to the equinox point, which is what? Equinox. Six there's 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night, right? Well, the same is true for the moon when visiting that point. So six hours above, up, on the way up and then six hours on the way down. Now, I want you to see another thing as long as we're doing this. Dig that when in the morning of Dolly's birth, I'm looking at 2.45 a.m., which oddly we call morning, though the sun has not yet risen. We begin the days at the middle of the night, but that's when the sun begins his daily climb, okay? Notice how at the time of Dolly's birth, the moon is not yet to the Aries point. Sorry, I said the time of Dolly's birth, but this is six hours before Dolly's birth, 2.45 a.m. And the moon is at um, 29 and a half degrees Pisces, okay? Well, where's the moon go after Pisces? Goes to Aries right? And she goes quickly. She moves like 13 degrees a day on average. So how much does she move in half a day? About six degrees. That's going to take us from 29 Pisces to like five Aries, right? So we dig this as we're going to watch the moon rising in the east and reaching in the south and then going to rest in the west. That's the primary motion. But we'll also see the moon going the other direction by the secondary motion. Even an hour later, the moon's now only three arc minutes from Aries, another hour, and now the moon's in Aries. It's past the equator. And as we continue, here's the moon reaching highest height about six hours after rising. Look at now she's well into Aries. This is Dali's chart. Moon's at two and a half Aries. It's just culminating on the way down, which is what happens on the ninth house side of the Meridian Midheaven. Let's go six hours more. And look at the moons. I'll rewind a little so we can see in respect to the Aries glyph, right? Well on into Aries. At this point, the moon's at... Um, five degrees Aries. So moved from 29 Pisces to five Aries in the course of about half a day. Pretty cool, right? So sometime go out there, watch the moon rise. Notice what um, stars, this is easiest to do at a full moon because full moon rises at sunset. And that's a huge part of my teachings in this class, like connecting to the phases of the moon to describe the cycles and the aspects. And I think you'll probably tune into that astrologically along our way. It's like essential astronomy, but I can't teach it all right now. Um, but go outside, watch a full moonrise, draw the stars that she's next to, and then stay out there for, you know, 10 hours or whatever, keep checking in. And you're going to see that she, as she of course is moving from the east to the west, that she's also going the other direction. And that, remember, is why we call the secondary motion direction through the signs moonwise, because she does this most quickly. What we call the primary motion, the daily motion sunwise, because it is certainly most dramatic for the sun to rise and turn it from night to day. All right. So there's a good amount of review, but redundancy is built into every great space mission. Now, why are the quadrants not the same size? And the answer is because south of west is much closer to south than north of east is. So when you hear astrologers teach you that the ascendant is east, be careful with that. It is eastern, it is east-ish, but when a northern sign is rising, it's north of east. And when a northern sign is rising, 
a southern sign is setting because the descendant will always be exactly opposite the ascendant, right? So if I'm looking at the ascendant, which is where the ecliptic intersects the eastern horizon, I've got to turn around to a 180 to see the descendant. And this is Dali's rudder. So let me move through time. And we're going to move from this most northern point. Actually, let me even rewind to when zero cancer is rising. Now the ecliptic is most north of the ascendant. And this is the, mo the greatest distortion between the ascendant and the meridian midheaven, the largest fourth quadrant, because the ascendant is extremely north of east and therefore much further than the east from south, from the meridian midheaven, much further than the descendant, which is extremely south of west. South of west is closer to south than north of east is, right? So a much larger fourth quadrant than the third quadrant. Let's move through time. Now watch the ascendant in respect to the eastern horizon. Actually, let's just look east and we'll zoom in. Watch the ascendant ruddering back and forth across the cardinal direction during the day. Do you see why the ascendant was called the rudder and why the ruler of the ascendant is called the steersman? And when the ascendant is rising south of east in the northern hemisphere where the mirrored heaven is always due south, that means small fourth quadrant because south of east is closer to south than north of west is. Can you see that? Now I'm going to bring in the celestial equator. We're going to look east again. And I'm just going to play this through time. And I'm hoping you can kind of see there's an equinox point rising. Here's an equinox point rising, right? When the ascendant is due east, that means it's where the ecliptic intersects the equator, and that's zero tropical Aries and zero tropical Libra. Every day, the ascendant descendant axis rudder back and forth against the cardinal directions. Okay. Um, as promised, we are going to head to the Southern Hemisphere. I might as well show you a kind of cool thing. I'm um, looking north now from Fueras, Spain, which has a latitude of 42 degrees north. It's kind of like New York-ish. Interestingly, Dali moved to New York. Um, the altitude to the celestial pole is equal to your latitude on earth. Okay, so this altitude right here is like 42 degrees, almost halfway to the top of the sky, which is square, the horizon It's 90, that's the zenith, okay? I call this the latitude principle, the altitude to your celestial pole equals the latitude of where you're standing on earth, latitude. Silly word, but it's easy for me to remember. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna start moving south and you can see the arrow which is currently located in Spain Let's bring it down and watch that north celestial pole dropping, descending, okay? There's one place, let me show it to you, where the north, where the celestial pole is directly overhead. Where is it? It's called the North Pole <laughs> because there, the top of the sky or the, the pole that where the axis is pointing is literally at the top of the sky. And so with the daily motion, the heavens are going to spin like a big top right? That's like the flat earthers dream at the North Pole. And they should all go hang out there. Okay. Um, and consider residing. Anyway, so let's bring it down. We're going to drop down from North 90. That's the North Pole. And we're going to come on down. Where do you think that North Pole is going to touch the equator or the horizon? I gave the, the, the answer. <laughs> it's the equator, the latitude principle, the latitude of Earth's equator is zero degrees. And so the altitude to the celestial pole is zero degrees. So here we are at the Earth's equator, where both the North celestial pole and the South celestial pole are on the horizon. Let's look east. This is the place where um, the sky spins like a wheel. Let me bring in uh, this thing easier to see that because the axle's on the ground. 
right? The equator is the flat earther's nemesis. <laughs> and especially this kind of attempt of, at a cosmology of, um, well, we're just on a flat surface with a dome spinning around us. Once you get to the Southern hemisphere and you realize there's another center of the rotation, that whole thing blows up, right? So this is one of the many ways actually where we can understand that our earth is generally round. Okay, so let's go down to the Southern hemisphere. I'm gonna end here. I'm gonna go to like 33 South. All right, let's, let's head over. We'll put our feet on the ground somewhere. Let's go, we'll be in South Africa here. Why don't we just, we'll go to Cape Town. Okay. So in Cape Town and in the Southern Hemisphere, when I look south, I'm looking at the celestial pole above the ground. Cape Town has a latitude of 33 south, 34 south, 55 out of 60 minutes, so 34 south. So this altitude of the south celestial pole, where as I said before, we don't have a south star in our day and age, but there's still a center of the rotation. So you just watch the sky and you can see where everything's spinning around. Um, it in Cape Town at 34 south latitude, the south celestial pole is going to be 34 degrees above the ground or about a third of the way to the top of the sky. That's 90, so 30 is a third of the way up. So here's 10, 20, 30, 34, okay? And that's not going to be where we see the ecliptic. In the Southern Hemisphere, we've got to look north because the Meridian Midheaven is always due north. Now that's the Southern Hemisphere, south of the Tropic of Cancer between the tropics, it gets a little more interesting and I'm not going there. We're gonna finish right here, okay? So on this day, we're just, we're, it's now <laughs> in Cape Town. It's like right now in Cape Town, it's right here. Well, right now in Cape Town, and let me show you a chart for it. <clears throat> so in where I am in Richmond, California, um, nine Virgos rising. And so Mercury is the steersman. Okay, but if I relocate this chart, remember, so let's just look at a few of these things. It's moon, 17 and a half Scorpio. Sun, 13, 40 Pisces. Mars in the last minutes of Taurus about to move into Gemini. Okay, so that's enough. Let's relocate this thing to Cape Town. Moon, 1727 Scorpio, Sun, 1341 Pisces, Mars, three arc minutes until moving into the sign of Gemini, right? Now Aquarius rising. So from a traditional point of view, Saturn is the steersman and he's in the first and he's very angular, the strongest house of the zodiac. And okay, I'm going beyond the scope of this astronomy for astrologers, but either way, in review, we see the planets are in the same degrees of the same signs and the same geometrical relationships or aspects to one another. The geometry is the same, it just turns. Why? Because the earth turns. So houses are unique to the location, the surface particular, where the signs are measured from the center, the hole below. Okay, so we have Aquarius. Well, remember that Aquarius is a Southern sign. So Aquarius is rising. When Aquarius rises, the opposite sign, Leo, a northern sign, is setting. So what we're going to see over here is that the ascendant, where the ecliptic intersects the eastern horizon, it's due south. And the descendant, sorry, I said due south, sorry. The ascendant is, oh gosh, and here's, here's the thing about going to the southern hemisphere. That's not the ascendant at all. Notice that I'm circling the intersection of the ecliptic and the western horizon, right? Because in the southern hemisphere, the east to west motion, when we look south, east is on the right. 
So as I said before, the chart works like our Northern Hemisphere sky experience. Look, it was designed, you know, in Greece and Alexandria, you know, that, they used to have square charts, but all this stuff came, India, Babylon, Saudi, you know, it's like a Northern Hemisphere tradition. It does not mean in any way that this does not work in the Southern Hemisphere. Gosh, I can show you that's true just by, you know, I've done so many sessions for Southern Hemisphere folks. Many of you will be from the Southern Hemisphere, which is why I wanted to present this to you. Okay, but this is the ascendant, right? So Aquarius rising south of east, but in the Southern Hemisphere, see how the charts um, reflected from your experience of the sky. Because if you go outside, you will see the sun and all everything rising on the right if you're looking towards the midheaven because in the southern hemisphere south of the tropic of capricorn the meridian midheaven is always due north so this is the fourth quadrant this is the third and notice that the third quadrant is smaller than the fourth we can see that here why because south of east Aquarius, a southern sign, is further from due north, southern hemisphere, midheaven due north, than north of west, Leo and northern sign. And it's trippy because when I show you in the planetarium thing, it's backwards. So if you live in the southern hemisphere and you want to like print a chart of the moment and go look at the sky, you've got to turn it around and look through it. Okay, or, you know, use a phone app like um, Astro Gold or Time Passages or whatever, like cast a moment now, take a screenshot, go into your photo software, reflect it this way, and then you're going to have an experience of your sky. In the Northern Hemisphere, you know, let me, we'll go back to Dali, or actually, let me just go now. Okay, now look, we've got a pretty, you know, almost vertical meridian. So actually, yeah, that's fine. We can start there. So I'm going to go right now and then I'm going to return to my default location, which is where I live in Richmond, California, where the meridian midheaven is always due south. Okay, you can see it's pretty close to a cross. Why? Because nine Virgo is here, pretty close to the equinox point, which rises due east, okay? So if I move through time, let's move an hour forward, two hours forward, now we're very close to the equinox point. Let's put the zero area, the zero Libra point rising. Well, because each of the equinox points is zero Aries and zero Libra, the points is, um, rise due east and set due west, you get a perfect cross. 721. Okay, so there you go. Zero Libra rising, zero Aries setting, so zero cancers at the Meridian Midheaven because due east is the same distance from due south than due west is. Okay, I'm going to finish here by going a few hours ahead in time. So I'm at 12.21 um, a.m. quote unquote tonight. <clears throat> Great, because I wanna show you the importance of this point right here. Now we have a Southern sign rising. Actually, let's make that extreme. So how do we do that? We get very close to zero Capricorn rising, the most Southern point of the Zodiac, 2.21 a.m. All right. Now look at how much larger the third quadrant is than the fourth quadrant because south of east rising in the northern hemisphere where the meridian midheaven is always due south is much closer to the midheaven than north of west. Okay. So the meridian midheaven, importantly, it is not the top of the sky. Like too often is sadly professed, not even close. Um, and importantly, dig it. It's not even the highest part of the ecliptic. That's like right here, right? Wrong. <laughs> because I need, if I want to find the top of the ecliptic curve, I need to square myself up. I'm here, I'm facing the midheaven due south. Well, what if I turn my body 
so that I am now aligned to the Oyox, to the rudder. And this is what our charts do when we let the computers draw them so that the meridian is not always vertical, which is another like option in the software. I see that the fourth quadrant is much smaller than the third quadrant. Why south of east is much closer to south than north of west. I see that the galactic center is rising. Cool. And I can see that here. But very importantly, the top of the chart is 2557 Virgo, always square to the horizon. And that's why it's often called the non adjustable which just means 90 degrees from there. Some call it the zenith point because though it's not the top of the sky, it is the part of the ecliptic that is closest to it. So again, the ascendance 26 Sag, so that points 26 Virgo right here, okay? And when we square ourselves up to the rudder, we now see that the midheaven is leaning left. Got it? And in the northern hemisphere, when a northern sign rises, like Cancer, the most northern sign, and we square ourselves up to the rudder, we're going to find that the midheaven is leaning right. And the top of the chart is here. Hence the mysterious case of one Salvador Dali, who hopefully now you can see why the midheaven is leaning to the right and the quadrant three is much smaller in arc than the quadrant four. And there's a mysterious part of the chart that some of us astrologers very diligently and intentionally work with, which is 2214 Aries. And that way I get to see that Saturn's aspecting in. And these are some of the things I hope you will be learning along the way here at this YouTube university. If you're interested in studying more sacred astronomy, right? I just gave you 7% of the information from my level one course and much faster than I like to present it. I had to skip over a lot of the parts of those topics and I've still taken a lot more time than I was invented to take. And I hope that's okay with Stormy. And I also hope it's okay with you. This has been a lot of astronomy for astrologers, right? Um, but I hope you will find that the more you get outside and connect to the heavenly happenings on the big screen of the living sky, the more you will receive your astrology directly all right and if when you're through this course and you've got some time if you want to tune more into that kind of embodied sensual sacred astronomy work look me up geminibrett.com courses page sacred astronomy for astrologers level one thank you for your presence patience awareness reception reflection love to hear from you taking the time to let this sink in and integrate. Don't expect it all to land at once. That's the most important thing to say about your astronomical, your astrological study. All you need to do is go outside on a dark night, get away from the city light, and you will see that the heavens are an endless thing and you can never know it all. So release yourself from the stress of feeling like you need to and just enjoy your trip. I will see you again later in this course uh, for an eclipse, an introduction to eclipse cycles class, where we'll also look some more into sacred astronomy, to some math magic, a little sacred geometry in that expression, and a good amount of, of astrology of correspondences. Until then, my friends, enjoy your trip. I will see you in space. Mm -hmm.